five, four, three, two, one. I'm John Miglosh for the Wisconsin DMA and the International Society for Strategic Marketing. Okay, let's flip over to uh, the first story. And this one's a funny one. Uh, Netflix is beating the U.S. military on the Space Force trademark race. <laughs> In Europe, Mexico, Australia, Netflix now owns the legal rights to the name Space Force. And what that really means, boiled down, is if you do a, you know, like my son was in the Air Force, so I got an Air Force hat, I got an Air Force coffee mug, I got Air Force, some Air Force shirts, you know, he had all kinds of Air Force stuff. And the Air Force owns that logo and can, can, run, can run those, and whoever makes those t-shirts has to pay a royalty to, to uh, the Air Force. Well, the Air Force... Uh, filed there Netflix has a series called Space Force <laughs> and their first season came out in the end of May 2019 and the, the government Space Force had been up and running since December or this yeah end of May oh maybe it just debuted now uh, well anyway so the government was ahead of things on actually implementing the use of the term so in the United States trademark law you know goes toward the first to use. But here's the interesting part. Fa uh, Netflix filed before the government for that trademark. And uh, so they have a claim of first to file, and the government has a claim of first to use. And in the United States, you know, the Air Force will win. But in all the other countries of the world, <laughs> it could easily be that the Space Force Netflix series gets the royalties to the t-shirts that the government prints up if you like the idea of the Space Force. And that is just really funny because I know having started businesses, you know, in one business we, we started, we had more, we spent more effort and time getting the trademarks, getting the patents, and we had global patents and global trademarks, but then the inventor decided to change the idea completely, which set us back about three years. And then when that was actually working, it was really hard to get it to, to redesign, the redesign to work. Then he decided that he could have left it alone in the first place, which I had said all along. But he didn't listen to me, and by then we were all sick of it. So these things have to work in alignment. It's harder to start a company than you think, but... Netflix will probably get the royalties in Europe, Mexico, Australia, etc. Now, maybe that's not where the t-shirts will sell, but you never know. And I hear that the, that the show is really awful. And, oh, by the way, the, the Air Force filing would not have stopped the Netflix from using the name because it's a, it's a, it's a parody and trademark law allows for that. They could make fun of Space Force though they wouldn't get the royalties when the Air Force uses it. So there you go. Okay, what's up with Amazon's drones? We've been following this for years. And uh, in 2013, Bezos said the drones would be up and running in four or five years. Last June said within months, and the internal scoop is maybe August 31st. The real, um, and there are drones up. There's about 20,000 drones, delivery drones, in our skies today, by 2026, Gartner predicts that the number is going to hit 1 million drones. But during this peak in drone delivery, Amazon was not visible. So Prime Air's longtime leader left the role in March, probably in frustration, one of several high-profile shakeups. The project is so sensitive that Amazon employees have shields over their badges, so you can't see who their identities are, and if you, they, you, they're they asked who they work for, they give names like Project Venice. <laughs> Apparently not everybody at Amazon is in favor of, of flying drones all over the place. Don't know, but, you know, some of that stuff happens. FAA regulations require that companies keep a line of sight on their drones at all times. Amazon asked for an exemption last July, but is still waiting to hear. And, of course, that dramatically limits the range, not the range the drone could fly, but the range that you can keep it in sight because they're little buggers and they're hard to see. And maybe it could mean on radar or on tracking or something, but it's a little different. 
Okay, Amazon, you know, I it was big news that, well, it was big news about th two, three years ago that all the big brands were coming up with a CMO title and putting marketers on the board of directors. Then about a year ago, a lot of them dumped it. So McDonald's dumped the, their CMO, and now they're putting one back. And they say that they're looking to marketing to help their recovery from the coronavirus shutdown. <clears throat> And uh, so, now we'll see what they say. I have seen firsthand the power a strong brand has in delivering a successful business strategy, says Krumpetsky. A brand is so much more than a logo, so they think that this can help. As we emerge from the global macro, that's the new CMO, uh, says, as we emerge from this global pandemic, consumers' trust in McDonald's brand and compelling marketing programs in every country where we operate will be critical to reestablishing the long, the strong business momentum we enjoyed in this cri uh, going into this crisis. I kept going to McDonald's. They do have pretty good coffee nowadays. After that big shake-up with the third-degree burns and all the rest of it, they got their coffee act together, and it's pretty easy to get it. Okay. <clears throat> Ad industry protests... California AG proposed privacy rules. What the, the, what the big scuttlebutt is, is that the Attorney General in California decided that if you use a private browser, which basically means everybody ignores that it's private, but it does usually block the cookies, so it's harder to retarget you. That's the bottom line. That's why I use them. I never go on Amazon without the privacy browser because I don't want the retargeting. I don't want something that I didn't buy to be following me around for the next few weeks. <clears throat> and so most of the time, if I'm browsing or looking for a product, I use the private browser. So the California Attorney General is saying, well, if you're using a private browser, that means you don't want any of your data captured or shared. There's a certain logic to that. The, the problem with it is that I didn't tell you you couldn't capture my data, and I don't really care because I'm in that industry. But I don't like retargeting. <laughs> That's the reason I use it. So the ad industry is saying, well, just because you're using one doesn't mean you don't that you care, which is my case, right? Uh, and we shouldn't just allow default pop-up blockers and other things to send this message. Now, the reality of the whole thing is, the funny part is, that your browser blocker doesn't have to be followed at all. There's no rule anywhere in the world that says, because you're using a browser blocker, we can't share your data, <laughs> your IP address, and they have what's called fingerprinting. Now, Net uh, um, Firefox actually is stopping the fingerprinting because with your I, with your IP address, your location, the kind of browser you're on, the kind of computer you're on, they can still there's enough uniqueness that in the grand scheme of things, your you're, you have a unique identity, and they see you went to this site, and they see you went to this site, and they see you went to that site. By comparing it all, they can kind of see what you're like, even if they don't know exactly who you are. <clears throat> so there's a lot of ways to track you without really knowing your name, address, and social security number. Just FYI. So it's an interesting debate. You know, I understand both sides. You know, I don't like when a default becomes the norm. No matter what, when people aren't even consciously opting out, you're assuming they're opting out. That's a good way to stop advertising in general. And finally, this was an interesting one. Retail feels more racist than police profiling for black Americans. And the story uh, digs in and says, 73% uh, of black Americans say very few brands and companies genuinely care about the state of black communities. And we covered the Ritz and uh, story a couple of times where it really seems they don't. <laughs> In practical terms, they don't. Okay, uh, Among non-Hispanic whites, only 41% say brands don't care. <laughs> I mean, we all kind of know brands don't care. So that's that's the takeaway for me. But, you know, blacks feel that way more than than whites, and that makes sense. And here's the one, here's another interesting one. In 2017, 51 said they expected brands to play a larger role in society by last year, it was 65%. So it's going up that they think brands should solve the problem. And actually, there's probably more hope for brands than there is for government. Because government just isn't in the business of changing opinions uh, very well. 
right? Everything the government does has unforeseen consequences, and often it it causes the opposite of what they're intending, like ethanol or the or the emission standards of the 60s and 70s. Um, and so um, uh, the takeaway here is discrimination doesn't come primarily from the police. It comes in the store. Now, I had an interesting experience years ago. I was looking for some new shoes, and I was buying Johnson Murphy's at the time, I think, and, you know, was looking at Allen Edmonds, and those were about 200 220 a pair, but I was looking for alternatives, and I was in Marshall Fields, I think, you know, snazzy department store, but I wasn't dressed that great. And the clerk came over to me, and she was just trying to be helpful, I'm sure, but she said, those shoes you're looking at are probably not in your price range. So she was profiling me and trying to be helpful. And I thought it was pretty funny, because I had a budget, and there, were, there wasn't anything in that store that wasn't in my price range. And uh, so she took me over to the sale rack, and there was a pair of shoes, the only pair that was my size, and they were like 35 bucks, and they were a, a a pretty high level uh, brand and I got them resold twice and I think I still have them around somewhere and real nice shoes for 35 bucks so she cost herself only about two hundred dollars on the sale and I was happy but it was funny how you know clerks can judge you and you know it's kind of part of their job I suppose if they're on commission they they have to decide if there's two people coming in the store who am I gonna wait on um, so there's, you know, there's rational basis for some of this, these kind of decisions. She was completely wrong, but, uh, I understand her point and I'm not saying that, and, and, you know, it can really matter. My daughter used to work at, at Verizon and she said sometimes the, you know, the, the kids would come in and want like a $400, $500 phone. And she like, was like, you don't really need this phone. <laughs> and, you know. And to work at Verizon, you kind of had to just sell them whatever they wanted, right? And so it's not your job in retail to make financial prioritization decisions for the people who walk in. But we're all human, and we tend to do that. So uh, if, you have, if you have clerks, you might want to talk to them about it, right? So have a great day. Like and share. Something to think about. Your friends will think you're smart. Bye-bye.